Hey everybody, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com here with another episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. This is a weekly show shot 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Times on Twitch in which I go through steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master while preparing for my Sunday D&D game. In this case, I am running an Eberron homebrew game called The Second Morning. This show, like all of the work of Sly Flourish, is thanks to the patrons of Sly Flourish. If you want to be a patron of Sly Flourish, you could do so by going to patreon.com slash slyflourish and becoming a patron. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive features, including an exclusive adventure, uh, adventure seeds and adventure generators, uh, a new thing that I'm working on called Sly Flourish's Uncovered Secrets, which is sort of like extensions to the, to the Lazy Dungeon Master workbook. Yeah, I, I presume. Oh my god, I thought I had the Lazy DM workbook sitting right here, and I don't. Oh, here it is. I always keep one within a few, a few couple feet of me. Uh, so there are uh, extensions to this book that are being delivered through Patreon. Uh, for those who subscribe. Subscribing is cheap. It's two bucks a month and it gets you access to everything there. There's only the one tier and it gives you access to everything there. And most importantly, you are helping support this show through paying for all this equipment that I need, paying for the bandwidth, paying for all kinds of things. Um, so uh, yeah, let's talk about it. So today I have a, a topic, a very particular topic I want to talk about, which is the lazy method for building cities. Uh, cities are a pain in the ass to make. And uh, we're going to talk about, I, I built a city for my, for this game uh, in a somewhat lazy way. And I want to talk about how, uh, how I did it. I didn't, you know, I don't know if this is the best way. I didn't do a whole lot of deep research like I did on the other steps in return. Um, but it has worked for me. And so I think it's probably worth talking about. And it's, it's a good idea. And it, you know, it fits my style, which is like, I don't want to do work, right? I don't want to take a lot of time. I don't want to do a lot of work. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, what else are we going to talk about? We're closing in on the end of the adventure. Uh, let's see. So so I did have somebody who either emailed me or talked, I think it was on Discord. Uh, somebody mentioned that um, they want to know how the last game went. That, that you know, I, I kind of quickly skim like what happened, um, but that I don't really go into it. And, and like, how did, the, how did the prep work? So uh, instead of just doing a quick summary, we will, I'm going to actually go into my Notion here. I haven't even loaded Notion yet. Uh, I am using Notion. Uh, if you want to know more about Notion, you can click it down in the show notes. Uh, or uh, Evil John, could you uh, fire up the Notion bot? Hey, there's Notion. So uh, if you want to learn more about using Notion for game prep, uh, you can see the, see it down in the show notes, or or you can see it in the uh, in the chat window if you if you're live here on Twitch. So we're gonna go to old adventures because I already archived it, and I think it was uh, that would be the fourth of October, right? That was last week. So these are the notes that I put together. Um, so drunken yokels, was this right? Uh, yeah, right. So this is uh, I, I started the session off with the drunken yokels uh, harassing the followers of the becoming god. And I was worried about it because it was kind of a powerful and dangerous thing going on. You know, there's like a lot. I mean, it, 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 it's a little contemporary. And, I, you know, I just kind of worry about how things like that goes. Maybe it's too contemporary. People are trying to get an escape and they don't really want to deal with this kind of stuff. Um, so I didn't overplay like the elements of racism and everything else. Um, but uh, I still want to have a scene where it's like you don't want to just butcher the bandits. Like if you butcher the bandits, it's going to go badly for the, the Warforged that are there. Uh, so the strong start worked well. It was fun and interesting. They had to like get in between the bandits and the Warforge. The Warforge were like, do not hurt these guys. If you hurt these guys, it's going to, you know, A, we are nonviolent Warforge. We have given up our weapons. We would rather go out there and let them kill us than fight them. And we know you're not us and we know your propensity for violence. Uh, but we're asking that you be nice. And so there was a lot of talk, a lot of diplomacy, a lot of checks. There were there's some use of charm person, right? Like they charmed a couple of the yokels who and they said, hey, this isn't, we're not having a riot here. This is just a party. And like the drunken yokels like, yay. So um, yeah, it was a bunch of checks. It was really interesting. The players were involved. They, I don't think anybody was bored or frustrated with the idea of like, uh, you know, they did firebolt a guy's shovel. So there was a little bit of, there was no physical violence inflicted upon the 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 drunken yokels but there was they did like they did intimidate them heavily with violence they threw fireballs from like the top windows and stuff like that and blew up the guy the guy had a shovel and he actually was getting ready to hit um the main the main leader of the um uh, uh, of the warforge with the shovel and the guy fired a fireball and blew up the shovel and so that so it was like if you have like a if you had like a sliding scale of like 10 being pure violence one being everybody walked away happy they they walked away at like a four and 
what um, uh, uh, what Shift did is said, you know, why don't you go and 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 have a joint festival with them and you know try to work more with them instead of just having like your own festival here and their own festival there. She had ideas and they were like, those are really good ideas. So they got to meet everybody else and then they did head down into the shaft. Uh, they started crawling through the under tunnels. Uh, here is the map of the under tunnels. I actually did use this map. So they saw the Dakani arches. They saw the uh, insect mound, I think. I can't remember if they saw the insect mound. Uh, they avoided the Black River and went up here instead. They went to the outpost ruins. They made it through here. I skipped the more gates and they made it to the um, Warforge dumping ground. They did see a crazy ass beholder with a million Drogon, Dro Drogon coming up from a big pit. That scared the hell out of them. They were... There was no plan on staying. They were like, run, run and shatter. Shatter behind us to drop rock on them and run. And that worked pretty well. Um, they did meet a ghost of the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers is like an orc uh, group. So that worked really well. Uh, so one thing I did here is I have these like uh, potential encounters. I had great gatekeeper orc ghost. And I, I rolled that one. And that was who they met at the Dakani arches. So I changed it to gatekeeper arches, right? I just reskinned. I reskinned my own stuff that I reskinned. Uh, in order to kind of show um, uh, the whole legend of the gatekeepers, right? Orcs are not just a bunch of brutish fiends or brutish nasty guys. They are the people who kept the Dakani or the the um, Dalekir down in Kyber. And the archway was one of the gates that they used to kind of bond and bind the, the Dalekir down below. So, you know, again, I'm, like, I'm trying to like kitchen sink all of the... Um, uh, all of the Eberron stuff I can, so they get real feeling, touches of all of the flavor of Eberron. I sort of want to hit not all of them exactly, but a lot of them. So like, I haven't gotten into the Demon Wastes. I haven't gotten into the Lords of Dust. You know, there's a lot of groups I haven't really gotten into, um, but I'm hitting on a lot of things that I think are pretty interesting. So they, um, so they carved through a lot of that. Um, and uh, made their way through the city. Uh, whoops. Let's go back to here. Drunken Yokels, they went down the shaft. They traveled through. They, they got to the charnel pit. They did not yet reach Eston. They, they, have, they just started facing the um, Black Tusk Warforged werewolves. Uh, so secret-wise, let's look at which secrets. Uh, Imperial Devil Fire took a bunch of mercenaries through the tunnels to Eston. They did learn that. Imperial was captured by Black Tusk Warforged and taken to the lair of Black Tusk. I don't think they learned that, learned that yet. There are many factions in Eston, including the Greys, the Black Tusks, the Children of the God Drums, followed by the Lord of Blades and many ragtag groups. I think they did learn that. Powerful magic in Eston has been released, causing living spells to run rampant. I don't think they learned that. Karshek is treated as a god in Eston, particularly by the Children of the God Drums, who make sacrifices to them every evening when the God Drums play. I don't think they know that. Karshek resides in a huge sealed sarcophagus known as Karshek's Crash. They did not learn that. Black Tusk Warforged saw what Imperial Defilon carried and brought, uh, and brought it and her to their leader, who is called Black Tusk. Um, I didn't learn that. Many mutated warforged roam the streets of Eston. Seeming, some like to believe they were mutated by the morning, but most recognize that House Kenneth built these abominations. I don't, I think they did learn that. Shift and Lord Crash were built in Eston at Skyfall Tower. They do not know that. That's a good one. Many powerful weapons of war still exist in caches beneath the streets of Eston. They did not learn that. Uh, Imperial Deflorn lost half of her mercenaries getting through the undertones. They did learn that. So, um, some good secrets and clues. Now, uh, and then what else? So Fantastic Location, Angwar Keep was cool. Uh, Under Tunnels was used well, and I didn't have any, like it served. So the, a, a good question is like, how well did my prep for last week serve the game? You know, and of course, like you go like, of course it did, Mr. Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master. Of course your book works really well. well that, you know, I would argue that I, I try to keep an open mind and I certainly want to learn. So if there were things that didn't work, I would I would say so. Um, and it worked, you know, this stuff worked fine. Now the, and the dirty trick is I'm running this for another group. So I kind of off my prep every other group. So in other words, I'm doing a lot of prep between two groups that then the other group gets to benefit from. And that's been very helpful, but I'm running two games a week. So it's still weekly, right? And most people are running games weekly. So, um, Glaive, the leader of the follower of the becoming God that worked really well. Uh, Imperial Devalarn is a, and Karshak. I, there's the NPCs. I, I did have a random NPC who I created was a guy. Oh, it was pretty cool. So they, they met a guy. He was one of the last mercenaries that Imperial Devalarn had hired who survived 
but didn't make his way. He, she said, he, he said that Emperor I made her way up the tunnels and got out of here, but I got trapped here. And, uh, then his head exploded and a intellect devourer came out of it. And there, and she's, he said, yeah, there are these weird tentacle mouth creatures down this other corridor and they were doing terrible things to us. And then his head exploded and a intellect devourer popped out and they're like, ah, fireball. <laughs> they got rid of that thing really quick. Uh, but they're like, well, that was something. And then they went onwards. So that worked. That was kind of a fun scene, you know, always try to throw. So I've been thinking a lot about pacing the game and um, like scenes and stuff. Right. And I believe in building situations, not defining encounters. And I think that that works when you like, you have this situation of going through the under tunnels, you, you want to mix in opportunities for role-playing opportunities for exploration and opportunities for combat. And that doesn't mean prepping it that way. You don't prep your, here's my role-play scenes. Here's my, well, you can, but I'm going to offer a different approach instead of here's my role play scenes. Here's my exploration scenes. Here's my combat scenes. And then you shuffle them together and you got a nice list and you get here. My six scenes, bang, 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 bang. That's a very easy way to prep. And I think I did it that way for a long time. Another way is you say, we're going to the under, under tunnels. Who's in the under tunnels? Here's a bunch of people in the under tunnels. What are some places that are in the under tunnels? Here's a bunch of places in the under tunnels. Um, and what's the situation? Characters are trying to make their way through the under tunnels to get from here to there. They have different paths they can take right? Then you throw the characters in there and you go, right? And they go to the first place and you say, hmm, I wonder who they might run into there. And you roll in back. I think it'll be this ghost of, um, this, this ghost of, uh, uh, get in losers. We're going to the under tunnels. So snark night. Hi, snark night. So, um, uh, you go to the under tunnels the first time and you, I roll and I go, Oh, look, it's a ghost of one of the gatekeepers. So now it's kind of a role play scene. They role play with the ghost of the gatekeepers. They learn about it. So exploration and role playing, they learn about the archway. They learn about the ghost. They're worried about the ghost cause he's a little scary, but he's like, well, but he's kind of cool. And I think they stole a dagger that he had. Right. And, and, and he was, they, they like, he had a sacrificial dagger that was actually, I think it was a, a, a Daleker dagger, but it was sitting at the top front of the gateway. And he's sort of this big ghost hovering over the top of it. And he looks away and somebody like mage hands it real stealthily and rolled like a 21. And he's like, you know, like, where'd my dagger go? <laughs> right. And then he ran. So that was kind of fun. Um, and then I was like, okay, so they, you know, what are they going to do next? Right. And then I was like, well, probably time for a bit of a threat. So then I rolled again. I was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to do the pit. And so I steered it. I said like, you don't want another role placing right after a role placing. You just had one. So let's do a bigger threat, which is, um, uh, Dolgrim, the, the goblin, the half goblin, Daleker twisted half goblin things. They're pouring out of a pit and you, you see one of them and it climbs up and they blast it. And they're like, that was like eight, that was like 12 damage. It was nothing to kill that. And you're like, yep, here come a hundred more. And I'm like, oh, a hundred. And I'm like, yep. And there's lights coming up. And they're like, what the hell are the lights? And then like an orb comes up with the big guy. They're like, oh, you're like a hundred delicate and a beholder run. So they run. And it was like, you know, the, the, the mines of Moria, right? Like, you know, fly you fools. And they're, they're cast and shatter behind him. Right. And so it wasn't combat because they only killed one thing and they never got hit by anything, but it was a stressful, I would call that a combat scene. Right. It wasn't like, let's get out the battle maps and the minis. It was like, you're getting chased by a hundred delicate and a beholder. What are you going to do? And then the next scene was running into that guy and another role play scene. They learn more about, but totally different, right? Instead of the ghost and then, which is more of like an explore the old past. The new one was, uh, let's learn about Impride de Flarn and where the hell she went and what happened to you guys. And oh my God, his head exploded. And now it's combat for about eight seconds while they blow up an intellect devourer. And then they go forward. And now we're going to start with, uh, facing the other ones. So that worked really well. Uh, some monsters, I didn't use face spiders or mind flayers, uh, and I'm going to use the Warforged werewolves now. I didn't drop in the pot rod of the pack keeper. I'd like to put one of those, but I don't know where I'm going to put it. Uh, that might be a good thing for Skyfall Tower. Old finger bone Azoriat. I think um, I did drop in one of these things. There was a dominate person or dominate monster. I think I gave him an item that has a single use of dominate monster. And uh, that's, you know, it's an eighth level spell right? And they're like, wow, that is crazy powerful, you know? So they've got a single use of a crazy powerful item. I love doing stuff like that. That, that works really well. Yeah. So that, so how the notes play out? The notes played out well. Now well, I'm going to cheat, right? I don't recommend this. Um, but since I went through all the trouble of looking at my old notes, I'm going to steal them because I got a bunch of secrets on here that are really the same secrets that I'm going to use next week too. And I'm lazy. Uh, I have a new trick for the notion template and this is in the default one as well uh wonder says do you use discord yes i use discord to play online you can find out all about that if you go to slyflourish.com and look for discord do a search for discord you'll see a whole article about how to 
play 5e over discord without anything else if you need a vtt my new current recommendation is one called albear rodeo which is a fantastic lightweight virtual tabletop that does not have any of the mechanics in it because you can use dnd beyond or discord for your mechanics and it works really really well it's fast fast and easy to use uh, so I have this new button, generate session planning template. Somebody last week was like, why don't you have a template button for that? And I was like, I don't know, because I don't know how to do one. And then I spent a little bit of time and I learned that you can do one. So this one is now in the, if you go, let's see, we're going to go back to the, the, this is the campaign template. So if you are copying the template, this is what you see. And now there's this generate session planning template button in here. You can keep that button. You can, you can get rid of all the text up here that you don't need. Uh, obviously, you can edit this down to what you want. Uh, but I'll show you how it works, which is you click it and you get a new template. And it goes right to it. Isn't that cool? Uh, so 11 October 2020, Sunday, Eberron. We're going to drop right here and go bang with dropping all those secrets. And we're going to delete the ones. Uh, delete. 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 So I'm just keeping the secrets that I did not drop, uh, that I had not used previously. I did just review them though. There's seven of them. There's a lot of secrets, but these are very Eston based secrets. Um, what I may do, uh, it, oh, what is going on? No, go away, man. Uh, I may, um, put some new secrets up top. Something you just need a map. You can move a token around it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Albear is great if you're just moving tokens on a map. It doesn't have any, it does, it's totally system agnostic. Uh, you can drop your own maps in there. Um, it doesn't have great tools for sizing the map for a grid or anything like that. You have to kind of wing it, at least in my experience. Um, but uh, uh, it works really well. It's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to compare it to the biggest competitor on the planet, which is Roll20, and everybody loves Roll20, and Roll20 is great, and people are having play, if you're playing D&D, go with the gods, right? But if you were like me, and you find Roll20 to be a little bit heavy, and you're using other tools already, like Discord, uh, it's a great way to just use a battle map without anything else. Oh, that's really nice. So, um, I want to add, uh, we're going to add some secrets to the top of the secret list. Uh, but let's start with our strong start, which is um, the Ware Forged of the Black Tusk. And we're going to have uh, one per character uh, attack them in the, uh, of the, the charnel pit of the uh, Ware Forged. Right, in the Ware Forged charnel pit. That is our location. So scenes, this is pretty straightforward. Um, the scenes are where, uh, where forged battle. I'm, I fill this out, I gotta be honest. Um, I fill out the scenes list every time and I guess it helps a little, you know, you probably know it if you watch the show, I probably spend very little time on scenes and because most of the time I know what it is or I don't know what it is. In either case, it doesn't help, right? Like, so like I kind of jot some things down to just really loosely get in favor. By the way, I forgot to review the character. So we'll go back and do that after this. Man, I'm jacked up today. I haven't had any coffee. Um, coffee's good. Warforged Battle, Esten. Um, I noticed that the search on... Um, uh, Notion has gotten significantly faster. So now it it seems to cache the stuff that you go to a lot, and then that comes up right away, and that's really handy. Um, so they go to Eston, and then uh, Lair of the Black Tusk is going to be a location. I don't know where else they'll go, so I'm going to put, like, question marks? Like, where else will they go in Eston? And we're going to talk about cities today. Uh, so I got a strong start. I got some scenes. I've already started filling out some secret clues, but let's go review the character, shall we? Should have started with that. Uh, so we go to our Sunday characters. Uh, by now, those of you who have hung out here for a while, you know who our characters are. We have Zarentir Delander. I think also on Twitch, uh, can somebody tell me? I think on Twitch, these characters are all loaded in the D&D Beyond template, so you can actually look at their character sheets on Twitch if you're watching on a desktop machine. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, we have Zarentir Delander, um, who is a uh, storm-marked, Storm Dragon Mark, Storm Sorcerer with a touch of Cleric, who uh, 
crashed his father's airship. He belongs to a rich company. His, you know, in my mind, I don't think the character, I don't think the player has this in mind. He's the Dustin Hoffman character from, um, <laughs> from, uh, the graduate. At least that's how his parents see him anyway. He probably is, he's, he's a lot stronger than that, but they see that. So, um, yeah, so that's him. I don't know that there's many character hooks for him right now. Uh, so we'll see. I don't know how I'll play that out. Um, Saber is a bounty hunter. He might have something to say. I think that the Warforged are like the, I think this is a good secret that like compared to Saber, let's, uh, this is why reviewing the characters is important because you uh, kind of get secrets. So we're going to have the, the Black Tusk are the antithesis of the uh, balance of the four winds of the four winds um, shifters. So like they are an abomination compared to like they're the they're the chaos to the lawful side of the four winds shifters, which is the group that Saber belongs to. Uh, I think that'll be a fun thing for Saber that I can I can sort of the character, the player is, you know, a very sort of lay back and, and play D&D kind of guy. But if I give him seeds, he hangs on to him. So I think for, for, you know, I can tell him like if I tell him you really feel like these guys, you know, the four winds monks have told you that these, you know, when you compare, like these guys are abominations compared to their, their chaos of what you have, they shouldn't be around. Then he'll be like, I hate these guys. Um, uh, I think he just click it. I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, shift. Uh, so Juliet is back in our game. Uh, she had to move, but she is back and now shift is back. So the interesting thing here, as I already have it in the notes, is that shift and crash were built in Skyfall Tower by House Kenneth. Uh, this is their home and she'll, I, I need to make sure like that's an important one. Uh, let me drag that to the top because um, that is as soon as she sees Eston, she'll be like, I've been here before, right? Like you, you have hazy memories of having been here before. And I think that that'll be a fun thing to tug on. Uh, Banner had a lot of play with the God, the, 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 the becoming God. And I think he too will sort of recognize the atrocities that have occurred in the creation of the Warforged of Eston. Um, you know, this is the, the, this is the forge where the Warforged were made and yet many terrible things were made here. And, and a lot of bad things happened here. I think that'd be a, a good hook. Shane Husk. I'm Shane might have been to Eston before as a journalist. Shane is a, um, hobgoblin wizard, uh, best-selling novelist who wrote about, uh, wrote about the morning and wrote about the last war. Um, and I think he will might've been here too. So that can be a good thing to, to hang on to. Uh, Arwen Chi Sizu uh, is a um, dragon marked member of House Civis and possessor of the Icosahedron that contains, I don't think she knows this yet. Um, so we're going to add this secret. Uh, Arwen. Contains the spirit of her father. Uh, is a big secret, right? That it's not a it's not a personality of um, it's not a Warforged personality in there. It is the spirit of her father, and her father knows where um, Skyfall, where where um, Claw Rift is. And she can embed the spirit inside of a um, docent, and with that inside of a docent, her father's spirit can um, can manifest. Uh, so that is a that is a good secret. And I think that was the final character. So I have reviewed the characters. Those are the characters in today's game. So we'll go boop. Uh, now I think I have eight secrets. Five, six, seven, eight. No, I've got nine secrets. So I really only need one secret more. Um, what else can they learn? There's so many things about Esten. And we're going to talk about Esten. So maybe I'll keep that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep that secret aside while we talk about Esten the city. Um, and when we go to fantastic locations, Eston is the, uh, the fantastic, uh, whoops, why did that work? I didn't highlight it. Uh, Eston is one, uh, black tusk. There, the black tusk is the other. 
Karshak. Uh, I don't think I have. So here's um, Karshak's, what's it called? Um, crash. And I don't have a page for that. So we're going to make a new page. This is a new thing. If you start to type at and put in a location, um, another notion, interesting notion tip. If you put at to a location that doesn't exist yet, it'll turn it into, hey, do you want to make a page? And I'm like, yes, I do. Thank you very much. And in my Eberron Second Morning page, uh, I'm going to create a Karshax Crash page. And I think I already have a Skyfall Tower page. I do. So those are some of the big locations in Eston. Uh, but I really have more. Um, for funsies, let's go fill out Karshak's crash. Um, and it looks like uh, Chernobyl Coffin. Um, that is kind of what it looks like. Uh, they built the, sar the, the sarcophagus. I think it's called the sarcophagus. Um, uh, it probably looks different than that. It looks more like that, but it's but more sinister. It's black. Um, that's not bad. We'll grab this one. That's a good picture. Open image in new tab. Uh... Karshak's crash. I don't want the image. Damn it. Copy image. I'll delete that. I'll live with that one. That's good enough. That gives me a general idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, and we'll say layer of Karshak. Um, hey, look, and it's linked to the notes. So now, oh, and then here's the other thing you do. So where it put it, it put it as a page here, right? It created a new top level page, but I can grab it and drag it to the campaign database. And now it is a database entry. And now I can here and a car shack and it shows me too. And I click on car shack crash. And as you see, I can now do tags and we're going to do a location tag. And now that's done. And now when we go back in here and we go to locations, you will see in the locations, all the locations I have for this campaign, including somewhere in here, got a lot of locations. There it is, Karshak's Crash. All right, Skyfall Tower and the other ones. So pretty cool, you know, pretty pretty neat way to, um, uh, to do that sort of thing. Um, talk about Notion real quick. Uh, one of the things I was wondering is, is the campaign database really worth it? Uh, the only reason the campaign data, the only value that the campaign database offers over just having everything as pages with, with subcategories is that you can tag something with multiple tags. So something can be both an item. Like if I go into items, I have lack, right? Lack is both an NPC, is, is an NPC, a villain, and an item. So if I go to any of those categories, um, if I go to villains, uh, there's lack. If I go to NPCs, there's lack. If I go to items, there's lack. So there's an advantage in being able to tag something a certain way, but it's add, it adds complexity to the notebook. And what I wondered is I could just put locations as a page and then have sub pages for all the locations in there. I guess the other advantage though, is you can't, you can't get this gallery view. I guess that's the other thing is that the gallery view is really nice and you lose the gallery view if you um, just go to sub page. I don't think there's a way to look at pages with a gallery. Uh, Wonder asks, how much do I make available on my players? Nothing. None of these are public. Um, none of these are, are meant, these are my notes with all the spoilers in it. And I, and I know that there are people who create notion notebooks that they can share with their players that have the player stuff. But ah, separating that is hard, right? And I and it's too much work for me. So I don't I don't have a separate, you know, I don't have a separate way to do it. There are certainly ways to do it. You can make a whole separate page. You could do filtering. But like, you know, 
you'd want to tag like every line and I just, it's just too much. So I don't, I don't, I don't have a separate one. There's certainly a way to do it. Instead, what we have is in our discord server, um, we have a, I'll show you a, yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, Cal, Caltram is like filtering custom views. Yes. You can do all that stuff, but, uh, uh, character pages are not filled in by our players. They're, 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 they're uh, those are all mine. Like everything in here is stuff just for me. Um, if we go to discord, uh, so what I have instead is if we go to my server where we have our Sunday D&D game, um, I have this maps and handouts. Let's get rid of this. And in the maps and handouts, I put images of things that they see. Uh, that The thin man, I love that. Uh, there's Cousin Kellard. Uh, so mostly like names of people. And um, this is how I do like screenshots of maps so they can see it. Um, or, or, you know, places that they see stuff like that. So the dreams, crazy dream sequences that they had, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so that's where we keep it. And then we have a story journal here and this is awesome. The story journal is done by the players. Uh, one of our players keeps this up, Shane, uh, Jay, this is, and it's just awesome. He keeps all the notes for what, what went on, found a bone and a bone enchanted with a use of dominate monster. Shane takes it. So, um, you know, this, this is a good, and I will paste, I copy and paste this back into discord. So I do have, the, I have those notes too. Uh, if I go here, uh, I think I have a Sunday game journals and this is all of the notes that they've been keeping in discord, uh, for the game. Uh, so that works really well. Um, uh, one question Kingfish said, how much do your players organically role play to the story? Both. We both, we go both ways. So they will, uh, they role play to the story and, uh, the story, uh, revolves around their actions. So I would say that it's a, you know, that's, that's how cooperative storytelling works is, you know, we are, we are yes ending with one another. Um, Abject not says I write weekly recaps in narrative form that I drop in other story amounts and box perspectives helps to bring players in this session up to speed. Yeah, that, that works well too. You know, and I think if you didn't have players who wanted to keep notes, it would be really great if you could like recruit one of your players to like, Hey, could you keep a game journal? You know, it'd be, especially like it's a good, I'll tell you as a player, keeping a game journal is a great way to keep your mind on the game instead of checking freaking Twitter. Hey, what crisis happened today? Uh, so yeah, so let's talk about the city of Eston and making cities. Um, so we are at the 32 minute mark. Um, how do you make a lazy city? Cities are hard to do. They're hard to make. They have a lot of options. They they're big and you know they're 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 kind of hard for players to get their heads around. Uh, cities are difficult places to deal with. And uh, today, I guess we're going to mostly talk about ruined cities. We're going to talk about a, a cities of adventure more so than bustling cities where, um, you know, where, where like law and order is in, in operation. We're going to talk about cities where law and order is not in operation. These cities of, of danger, right? And the, the approach that I take is similar to the other aspects of um, – uh, lazy prep, which is like, you know, make lists of 10 things. So for, for Esten, when I created Esten and I have a nice, um, page here for Esten, uh, I went to our good friend, Dyson logos, Dyson logos.com, Dyson logos.blog. I think both work. Um, and I went to, he has a city. If you go to Dyson, so Dyson logos.blog is where I go. You go to maps, uh, actually, uh, take that back. Whoops. You go to maps and you go to cities and towns, right? And you can find a whole bunch of different cities. Now I'll give you another trick, which is sometimes you might say to yourself, you know what, this is great, but the river should be on the right, not the left, or it should be going east, west, not north, south. Rotate the image uh, or flip it completely. So if you like, you like uh, Sears Mill, but you're like, I need that to be on the Eastern coast instead of the Southern coast, rotate your map to the right. And you could even like flip the map. If it's a map that's con that, that you've seen some more, you can flip it and everything's in reverse order and it shakes up your character, your players enough that they won't recognize the map if they've happened to play it before. So you can actually, if you like, if you have certain maps that you dig, there's so many maps here you don't need to, but so I went through here and I just looked for a map that I, that I liked. Uh, I didn't actually have to rotate it. I don't know which one, I don't know where it is in here. Um, but somewhere down here in the list, I was like, oh, there's a good map. That one will work. And I knew I wanted it sort of on the side of a river was basically it. And I wanted a couple places, particularly a place like where is Karshak's crash? So I was looking for sort of big, big, big rooms, right? And 
I ended up with this map, which sort of has this river bank on the right. It's got some smaller rivers that go along to it that I think can go into the Mornland. And I love this, like this northwestern keep. I was like, that's where Karshak's crash is. And there's actually a lightning rail that leaves here and goes out. So I knew I wanted that. So I've got a map and it's like, okay, but now what, right? Like, what do I put in here? And what I did is I opened it up. I use a Mac, uh, but you could easily do this on a PC with um, paint or something like that. Uh, and I just started labeling things, right? I in, in paint or in preview, you can label with black text on a white box, which means you can drop it onto a map. You, if, you, if you look closely, um, you can see that... Uh, you know, there's there's really a white box around the name, and that's so I can read it. it. It won't get, you know, it won't get caught up in the text. And you can do it in PowerPoint too. You can do it a whole bunch of ways. But I want it, whatever it was, I want it to be fast. I wanted to be able to drop labels on the map as fast as possible, um, with as little worry about monkeying with the interface as possible. So that the hard part is the creative thought that went into it. The hard part is coming up with it. And I was like, okay, so what's going to be here? Like, what matters? And I was like, okay, well, I know I needed Karshak's crash. And I looked up here, I'm like, that's kind of cool. How about an undead quarter called the tombs? So I made a place called the tombs. Um, I saw this and I was like, that's kind of neat. Let's call that Skyfall Tower, just coming up with the name. And then I was like, what if that is actually a House Kenneth Tower? And what if there's somebody still there? There's a House Kenneth person still there. And it's the one tower that has not been destroyed with the rest of the city during the morning. Um, House Kenneth is destroyed and well looted and ransacked, but I'll drop that on here. Theater of the Greys. So I have I have a bunch of factions that I knew I wanted. One are the children of the, the, the children of the God Drums is one. These are the worshipers of Karshak, the children of Karshak. And I said, what if they actually took over a prison? And so their, their lair is a prison. Uh, and they come out at night from the prison and they, and they uh, look for sacrifices to give to Karshak. Uh, so they're one group and they're real nasty cultist types. And then the other one is Theater of the Greys. And the, the Greys are a... Um, ah, so uh, Callum says, who the hell is Karshak? Uh, that's not what he said, Karshak. He says, I'm blanking on who Karshak is. I'm trying to... Karshak, let's go to Karshak. Karshak's one of my favorite NPCs I haven't yet dropped in. Karshak is a sentient warforged lightning rail that was built by House Kenneth during the war. It is super smart. It is super powerful. Uh, its personality is wired into all of Esten. So it knows what's going on all throughout Esten. Uh, it's also insane and probably suicidal and, uh, and really angry all the time uh and karshak at, in its lightning rail form uh sits inside of its crash and seethes but anybody who tries to go and approach the crash without his permission gets disintegrated so you can't just go and say hello to karshak uh you know there's there's only a couple doors to get into the crash and they are they are they're sealed up by karshak but uh the city knows karshak exists and and worships it like a god and so they every night uh the god drums play and the god drums is the song velcro fly by zz top uh i'm stealing this directly from uh uh the, the wastelands uh stephen king's book wastelands all this stuff is stolen from wastelands i just love it so much i want to use it directly so karshak and is is blaine the mono uh from uh wastelands if you've read wastelands and if you haven't you should read wastelands because it's really good Read all the good Dark Tower books. It'll take you a year. So um, they, uh, uh, big sentient lightning rail, very powerful. And the only being that knows how to get to uh, the, uh, uh, the only being that knows how to get to uh, uh, the, the, the city of making and the glass plateau and where the morning occurred. So, you know, Imperai was trying to find out how to bribe Karshak to get to uh, making. And he, she was doing so for Lido Skal. Um, and it's the only way to get there. But the reality is Lido Skal has another way to get there. He's going to use the sisters of Sora, the daughters of Sora Kal. And one of them is a seer and she can see a path that can get them there. She can open a gateway that will get them to, um, uh, that will get them to, uh, to, to, to the, to the, uh, to the place where the morning occurred. So that's who Karshak is. I wrote fucking, I swear, swears, sorry, bad language. Um, my own notes. So that's who Karshak is. Uh, and so Karshak has a big play in Esten, obviously. Uh, 
So I started dropping other things. So I dropped a bunch of names and I knew I was going to have black tusks. The, who are the black tusks? The black tusks are warforged werewolves that were built by House Kenneth. Why werewolves? Because I am play testing a fantastic lair called Lair of the Black. Uh, I think it's called the Lair of Black Ice now or the Curse of Black Ice is, is the final name. And uh, it is a uh, frost giant werewolf. So, and it's got a bunch of werewolves that work for it and I want to play test it and why not drop that right in the middle of here and just call him Warforged, reskin him as Warforged and I can play test my lair and offer some fun to my group and no one's a wiser. And I've already, my other group's already been doing it. So I had, I knew I was going to layer Black Tusk and I was like, well, how about the Lord of Blades shows up? So we have some Warforged that have come in on a ship, uh, like a, like a river boat uh, called the Warship of Blades. And these are followers of the Lord of Blades are here in town and they may show up. Uh, we have the yard. The yard is sort of where uh, the Warforged were thrown away. That's that. That's what leads down. That, that, that The yard is where the characters start on this map. And it's a essentially a big open floor factory with a big pit where they threw the Warforged that they no longer needed or that were broken. They threw them down into the charnel pit. The factory is where Warforged were made in bulk. Uh, Theater of the Greys, there's a group of survivors of this town called the Greys who are not sacrificial maniacs. Um, and they're just trying to survive, but they know if they try to leave the city, they're basically dead. So there's not a lot of them left. And they have a theater that they live in. They live in a theater that sits out in a big man-made lake with, with bridges that they can lay out to, uh, so that people can't get over to them. So every night they go in there, um, and uh, they go in there, and that's where uh, they, they live. And then during the day, they go out and hunt. So it's possible to meet a gray, a uh, member of the grays. I took the grays again straight from uh, Dark Tower. So I have 10 places, I think. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And that was my approach. Is like, name 10 interesting places. So here's the city. How do you build a city? Here's approach. One approach is get a map. Write down the names of 10 things that are in the city that they might, they might see. You don't have to put them all out in front of the players at once, but if you have 10, that's more than enough. It's like secrets and clues. You have more than enough than you need, and it's enough interesting places to go. So those are big places. Then once you have 10 places, I have a bunch of stories about Eston in here, text that I don't necessarily need. Then I said, uh, what are 10 interesting monuments that exist in the town? So what's a, a place is like a dungeon. It's a bigger location. It's a place that's got a map. It's a place that's got multiple rooms. A monument, uh, Evil John, if you're using Roll20, you can use the text tool to overwrite the town name or even building legends. Yeah, so if you do, in fact, um, uh, I know that uh, uh, James Hunter Castle builds his maps by dropping a map into uh, Beyond, DD, into Roll20 and, and annotates it there. So that can work. Um, so what are some monuments? And so monuments are, it's a random list. It's a random list of weird objects that the characters may see when they're traveling through. And I drop these in anytime the characters are going from one place to another. So when the characters are going from the yard to the factory, I say, okay, you're making your way along through the ruins of this once beautiful city. And you come across uh, a molten pool, the, the, the floor the, 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 the ground has broken through and 50 feet down is a giant pool of molten metal with pipes that are pumping it through, right? And so you have an interesting thing for them to see that kind of tells a little bit about the history of, um, yeah, tells a little bit the history of Esten and uh, is, a, is a backdrop for an encounter. Uh, and then, so you got 10 monuments, come up with 10 monuments. And then you have 10 encounters. What are 10 things, 10 groups the characters might run into with a key of they may not be, uh, th these are not combat encounters. They're, they're just, they could be NPC encounters or they could be in, uh, uh, interaction encounters. So we have flock of razor winged birds. We have pack of Wareforged war Warforged wolves, followers of the Lord of Blades, the um, Black Tusks, independent bandits and thugs, crazy explorer archmage. That's probably the guy from um, uh, Skyfall Tower. Uh, a weird living spell, a band of gray scavengers, uh, children of Karshak, a uh, Warforged Titan, uh, or sword raids from the Mornland, um, sword lace from the Mornland, or a friendly clockwork dog, right? And so I can roll on this, or I can use this list and think to myself, like, huh, I wonder which one uh, would be good right now, which one would be fun. And if like they fought a bunch of battles, then maybe grab one of the ones on here that isn't a uh, combat encounter or a hostile encounter. Uh, if they've been just wandering and it's time for a fight, you know, go ahead and throw one of the one of the other ones in there. So I can use this as a 
not just a random list, but a, a, an idea list to see like, you know, how this goes. And so if you think about the, the, what I, the kit that I've got here, the kit is I've got a map, I've got pictures, I've got, uh, on the map are 10 big locations, right? On the, then I have 10 monuments that they might find while they're wandering through. And I have, I actually have 12, but you know, 10 is fine. Uh, I have 10, 12 encounters that they might run into. And what I've done is I've set up a toolkit for me to improvise Esten as the game goes on. I don't have all of these pre, I don't know what monument is uh, sitting between the yard and the factory. I don't know what monument is between factory and house Canathera. I just drop a random monument in at any point and I can pick one. If I want to pick one, I can, um, uh, you know, I can go any way that I want. Uh, fire off the notion bot. Somebody's asking, Hey, what tool is that? Fire off the notion bot. By the way, anybody else that's in chat, if anybody else asks about notion, feel free to fire off the notion bot. You can do so with exclamation, exclamation park, no, exclamation mark notion, bang notion, bang. Yeah, bang notion. So, um, yeah, so that's the toolkit. Now, there's some some other things that you need for the city, though, and for city-based adventures, this is this is important. Uh, is a reason to be there. Goals. The characters need to uh, have a goal in the city. Wandering around a city on its own is not great. Having the, the ghost could the goal could be a rumor. It could be an actual quest, something they're really meant to do. Um, you, you can kind of play it off. So you could have rumors of, you know, like, well, I, I'm going to drop some of the secrets on them and say, like, you look at Skyfall Tower and you realize, like, you've seen that before. It was, you came from there. And, like, she's going to be like, I'm, I want to go explore Skyfall Tower, right? So maybe she doesn't. Maybe, like, I don't know if I want to go back there, right? But maybe she does. And so you can drop hints. And, and actually, if you look at how Chapter 2 of... Rime of the Frost Maiden um, handles that chapter is they have rumors that you can drop in front of the character, the players to determine whether they should go there. That gives you a sort of a loose way of running it or a heavy way. You, quests are a heavy way to run something. Like the quest is save Imperi to Falarn and get a hold of the, the docent. Like that's a quest. You need to do it, right? If you don't do it, bad things are going to happen. A rumor is you think you might have come from Skyfall Tower. You don't have to go. Nothing will change. The world won't end if you don't go. But that might be interesting, right? Or you hear rumors of that the factory is where Warforged were originally made. You know, that's probably not enough. But if you say like, and there are upgrades, you know, rum there are rumors are that there's a chamber in there that no nobody's been able to get into that supposedly have upgrades for Warforged. So that would be like a tasty rumor. You don't have to do it, but it's a reason to go. Um, I don't really have other tasty rumors because our, our, the quests in Esten are so refined. I don't really need rumors for all of these. Um, but you could say like the, you know, the Greys are a friendly group of fo followers who are trying to make or fo of wanderers who are trying to, uh, um, you know, trying to stay alive in a hostile city. And it's rumored are that they stay in one of the few places where you could actually rest safely. Right. And so now, oh, if we need a rest, let's go talk to the Greys. Right. Or, um, you know, House Kenneth, supposedly there are catacombs underneath House Kenneth that go on for miles that supposedly c contain some of the, the house's darkest secrets. You know, people might be interested in that. So you can sort of have rumors that to, to go places, but I don't really have a lot for Esten. Um, but, yeah, having having a reason to be there is a really big thing to have for any kind of city that you're running. Why are they there? You know, drop, th you know, drop a handful of rumors. You could do both. Give them a couple of quests and like three or four rumors, right? Don't do too many. You don't want to drop 10 rumors on people. It's too many. A three, you know, the, the rule of three is always a good one. Like what are three quests that they have here? What are three rumors that they run into? That, that's always, that was not bad. I think if I was making a city from scratch, three quests, three rumors, 10 notable locations, 10 monuments, 10 encounters. That's pretty good. Uh, in Discord, we talked about this a lot. In the Patreon uh, exclusive Discord channel, we talked about this a lot. And because uh, I'm working on a city generator, as part of uh, the adventure generator uh, package there and in, in, in for patrons. And um, some people said like, well, you know, some other things you need for a city is like, why does the city exist? You know, what what trade does it mean, is it into? And stuff like that. And th those are important questions too. I don't need to worry about it here because I already know the answer, right? And a lot of times you kind of know the answer. You know, the answer here is this is the place where Warforged were made during the war, right? This is a city of around House Kenneth where the Warforged were made. So, um, you know, and it's got like, I've got tons of text about, about this stuff, but it doesn't really matter that much because what matters is what the characters are doing there. 
and the characters are going to locations, seeing monuments, and getting getting involved in encounters and going on quests and following up rumors. <sighs> I need to take a breath. I need to take a drink. So that's my thought about cities. Um, and that's what I'm doing here. Let's go back to, uh, oh yeah, backlinking is so awesome. Somebody just said, oh, backlinking, backlinking is great. You know, where, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I clicked the wrong one. Uh, where anytime you link to another page inside Notion, it links back. I'll, I'll give you another cool tool, which is if you export your notebooks into HTML, it gives you a local version where all the back, oh no, it doesn't have backlinking. Yeah, they really need to have backlink, backlinking into the HTML export. Um, but all the links do work. So all the internal links that you make work in the HTML version of your export. So if you need a local copy, because you're worried about bandwidth or you want to have a backup, uh, and I, and I recommend having a backup, uh, that works. So I've got my locations, uh, NPCs. So monsters, uh, we have, uh, were forged, which are just werewolves. Um, there's a bunch that are listed in the encounter, so I don't think I'm going to do much there. Are there any other? Oh, yeah. So 10 more minutes in the show, and uh, I'm going to preview another idea. So I don't really need to worry about monsters. I'm, I'm good at monsters. And treasure, you know what we're going to do? We're going to steal some of the treasure that I had laid out in the previous um, uh, in the previous uh, notes because those look pretty good. Oops, wrong one. Do, do, do. Old adventures. Do, do, do. Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. The Rod of the Pack Keeper uh, is a good one. So that, because uh, I think it's time that uh, uh, Shift got a hold of one of those. If you ever have a Warlock in your group, Rod of the Pack Keeper is one of the best items they can get. It's a really good item. It's not overpowered or anything like that. It really is a good, whoops. It's really a good, uh, good item. And then let's drop some relics in here. So let's go here. We will go to my random treasure. Oops, that's not the right one. We will go to my random generators and we will go to Eberron relics. Uh, carved medallion of RY that cast conjure. That's pretty, that's pretty good. I like that. Um, what else do we got? Gate. Decorated title idol of Zendrek that casts Evard's Black Tentacles. That's not bad. Maybe that's something that uh, Emperai has. Um, we'll do one more. It's always good to have like three to pick from. Burned Cup of Draconic Prophecy cast Dimension Door. That's eh, kind of cool. I like Dimension Door. Uh, crumbling Tiara of Dakan. Cast Chromatic Orb. Uh, decorated Orb of Suatar. Smoky Bird Skull of the Shadow Marches that casts Vampiric Touch. That's interesting. Chilled Amulet of House Lirindar that casts Anti-Magic Field. Uh, that's kind of cool. That's a big spell, isn't it? I don't know if I want to give him Anti-Magic Field. That sounds like a pain in the ass. Glyft Bowl of Valinar that casts Conjure Elemental. I kind of like that. I might not make it Valinar. I might make it somebody else. Um... We're going to do Lirindar uh, because uh, that way it ties to one of the houses of one of the creatures, or one of the characters. So that's good. So I've got that going there. Um, NPCs, we have Imperi. Uh, we have, uh, so I have another NPC that I made for the Wednesday group that worked well, which is Silas. Silas DeKnef is the Archmage, uh, and he looks like um, that guy. And he is um, reclused in Skyfall Tower, and he is uh, the 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 true maker of Shift and Crash. Um, mentor of uh, the other Deaconeth guy. Uh, David, no, that's David. Silas, Constantine, Vincent? Who's Vincent? That's Vincent. Vincent is Shift's maker. Uh, so that is who uh, Silas is. 
So that's a good NPC. Um, and I'll probably, hey, thank you. See, look, people helping each other. Um, I think that's good for NPCs. I don't think I need any more. Uh, so another thought I had about where to go in, um, uh, you know, how to get into some crazy stuff with, uh, uh, with the more with the Mornland, and that is by let me pull it up here uh i only got a f five minutes left i'll probably preview it now um so monty cook games uh monty cook was a uh, one of the lead developers of the third edition of DD &D and has since made his own company called Monty Cook Games. He's been writing RPG stuff forever. He and Bruce Cordell have been lifelong friends that now bo both work at the same company, making D&D stuff. And they um, so are, have made a book called Arcana of the Ancients. And Arcana of the Ancients is a 5e book of science fantasy. And it fits perfectly with crazy Eberron stuff. First of all, the artwork, their artwork in their books, I think is second to none. I think it's the best artwork in the industry that I've seen. I love it. And it's got a ton of stuff in here for 5e. Um, for a new, If you want to drop Numenera stuff into 5e, this is to do it. But it's got a lot of like techno magical stuff, which actually fits Eberron really well. Uh, it's got these ciphers, uh, are a whole thing. So we, we might actually, instead of, um, uh, let's actually go to some cipher tables and let's pull up some ciphers. So how many tables are there? Two? Uh, so there are two D100 uh, cipher tables. So let's uh, Google uh, No, how do I roll dice in Google? Oh, there it is. So, uh, all right. So we'll use table one. Uh, and now I roll a D100. Uh, so roll that. 69. Nice. Uh, frigid wall projector. Let's take a look at that. Um, da -da. When activated, this synth and crystal device creates a wall of supercooled air 30 feet on a side and one foot thick that lasts for 10 minutes. When the wall first appears, each creature within the area must make a dexterity saving throw. So it's like a freezing wall. Um, a creature moving through the sheen of frigid air for the first time. So it's like a wall of fire. That's a cool one, right? So we're going we're gonna to grab that. In fact, what we'll do is Windows Shift S, and we will screen grab that one. And we will, uh, we're just going to go straight into our notes here in the treasure and paste it in. Because that's a cool one, right? Um, so there are, so relic, the idea of relics in my game, I, I stole directly from Numenera. Um, and I want to use this book more. The other thing it has are crazy ass monsters. And I think that these, I, I kind of want to spend some time. I'll probably do that right now because I bet you it would be really cool uh, to drop some of these crazy ass Numenera monsters, particularly the ones that are like joint, like look at some of these things. Um, some of these joint techno, you know, mixtures of technology and, and you know, uh, and, and being some of these, you know, there, look at that guy. What's going on with him? The peerless. Uh, would be perfect things to drop into. Um, look at that guy. Gorgallon slug thrower. Weird soldiers. So there's a lot of strange techno uh, fantasy creatures in here that I want to drop in. Um, uh, and I think it could be very cool to run. Uh, so I'm going to grab my book off the shelf and I'm going to use it. I remember that guy. I ran that dude. It's got a bunch of human heads that speak to you. And then it's really underneath. It's a giant crab monster. Uh, 
So Arcana of the Ancients is the book. Uh, my only complaint about Arcana of the Ancients is that it doesn't, a lot of the style of writing in Arcana of the Ancients does not follow the style guide of fifth edition stuff. So there's times where you like read something and it reads weird or, or you're like, you have to think about it. So I'll say like this lasts for one round and you're like, does that mean the end of the beginning of the character's next turn, right? It doesn't explain some certain things. So there's there's times when um, the, the style of writing that Monty Cook is putting into 5e stuff does not match the standard 5e style guides that I expect. And that can get annoying. But, um, and they, the other thing, and this isn't good or bad, they hit hard. So if you look at the monsters, they are, I think the monsters in, in Arcana of the Ancients, and there's a, a book called Beasts of Flesh and Steel, which is their additional monster manual. Uh, let me see if I can find that. I, I just, Beasts of Flesh and Steel, I just saw it and then I moved. Uh, Beasts of Flesh and Steel. Again, great artwork, right? Amazing artwork. Um, and this one had a lot more of the mechanical stuff, so I might use this. Uh, the creatures hit really hard. Let me let me pull up an example. Um, they hit hard for their challenge rating, so like you don't need to beef these guys up. Uh, Argots, for example, and this is an example where like the style is different. It says the Argots attacks are treated as if magical. I get what you mean, but that's not typically how it's stated. But if you look at this guy, he's a CR eight, right? That's pretty powerful, right? So you know, if you had a CR eight guy versus a group of level eight characters, for example, level eight characters, eight times seven is fifty six. Is that right? Math is hard. Fifty nine. I, I think I got that right. Um. So uh, this guy attacks three times. One with its bite and two with its claws. Its bite does 18 points. Its claws do 18 points. So that's 18, 36, um, right? I think I have that right. Uh, 36 and then another 18 uh, is 46 plus 8, 54. 54 points of damage that this guy does on a single attack or a single round of attacks, right? So, you know, I think that's, high it feels high it'll scare the, sh the, the, the it'll scare it'll frighten your car your players that's for sure try not to swear on discord um or on twitch so um anyway um yeah so grant this is uh beast of flesh and steel the 5e book from monty cook uh from monty cook games uh for high-tech D, D monsters and I'm probably going to drop some of these nasty dudes into my Eberron game uh, as they explore the insanity of the Mornland. I think that this will be a fun one. I should be getting a physical copy of the book. I have the Arcana of the Ancients book. Um, and I'm going to go whip that thing out. So it might be a fun way to do it. So, it, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably talk more about this next week. That's sort of a preview. Um, and uh, cool stuff. So, and I love Monty Cook games. I back, like I back every Kickstarter, almost every Kickstarter they've got. And they're putting out tons of stuff. The Cypher system, I, I got to, you know, Mike Shea is going to end with a controversial statement. My controversial statement is, uh, I think I like the Cypher system more than I like 5th edition. Um, I play, I love 5th a lot. And 5th has a lot of growth, a lot of teeth, a lot of, of longevity. It lasts a long time. I'm very happy with 5th edition. I think it's the best version of D&D &D ever played. Unlike fourth or third, where I was ready for a new edition, I am not ready for a new edition of fifth. I'm looking forward to uh, Tasha's, um, and I like that where they're going with things. I like that they're making some really good changes. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy with fifth, and I love that I can just you know grab, like the player's handbook that I've had for years, right? And I can play D and D with this. I've had this like forever, and it's fine as is, right? The book is fine as is. There's no errata that I absolutely have to have. You know, it's, it's just a great book. Same with the Monster Manual, right? Like, the Monsters and Monster Manual. I still just whip out my Monster Manual, grab a book and go. But, that said, big but, cipher, there are parts of the Cypher system that I think are just fascinating from an RPG perspective. It's a rich RPG with a lot of character options and character growth. You can really mix up your characters well. I think it probably fits short-term campaigns uh, more than long-term ones. Like, I don't think you'd have like a four-year campaign because there's not really that many levels of growth for a character to reach, I don't think. Um, but the way they design a character, you have sort of three main things that uh, define who your character is. So there's lots of combinations that go on there. And a Numenera is a beautiful setting. The, the science fantasy in Numenera, I think, is, is a wonderful setting. 
So I like to imagine that in an alternate universe, I'm playing Numenera all the time because it's just a wonderful RPG and you can learn a lot from it. There's a lot of tips that I have gotten for my fifth edition game by reading about and playing Numenera. So I highly recommend it. And I love the Cypher system. Um, so I think it's interesting that they're taking Cypher system stuff and putting it into fifth edition. I think that's cool. Um, but also like they should just sit on Cypher system because it's so great. Um, anyway, I, I am five minutes past the hour on the show. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I want to thank all of you fine viewers. Grant, Grant Ellis is here. Hello, Grant. Sorry to, 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 to run right as you show up. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming and I want to thank, uh, uh, you know, Evil John as always for keeping an eye on the channel and helping people out. And thanks to you who have been po po poking the, the notion button every time somebody says, Hey, what tool is that? And uh, yeah, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, and if you're listening to the podcast, it's going to be a, a podcast as well. So um, yeah, listen to all the things. Click all the subscribes. Feed the algorithms. Help me out. Go to the Patreon, all that stuff. But mostly get out there and play some D&D. &D. Have a great day.